Now, you got the first choice to say yes or no. So I have to say yes or no. So I have a rule. I don't negotiate the price. I say you, I'll, I'll first, you just tell me a price, I'll say yes or no, but I won't negotiate. Why? If I don't leave the last 10 or 20 percent with that person, I'll not be the first port of call next time. And I'm bringing my collection. So I will say, yeah, I could squeeze the guy for the last 10, 20, 25 percent maybe. But you know what? It's not really worth it. Because then the deal flow will stop. They'll say, Nimalaya is the last port of call. After you've tried to sell the Jamni to everybody, go to him. You'll always sell it to him, but you won't get a good price. You see? So it's a question of how you want to play the chase game. Right? So what should you do with the article in Nimalaya? Huh? Where does it go? Which one? It's not yeah, you're, you're so poor and rational. That's because he's got the blinds turned down and the lights <laughs> off. <laughs> you need you need sunlight for it. No, no, no. I, I think you're all being a bit unfair on Nirmalaya. Maybe just Adrenaline close when he sees Jamdi Roy's work. That's it. Whatever light. I just think that the panel was better if people have different points of view. So I don't know. You need point of view. I chased many years ago something. Uh, I don't collect uh, cockroaches, but uh, variety of things close enough to that. So the chase was a parchment of leather uh, signed last time in 1590. And it was a legal document signed between a trader who sold slaves to a wealthy landlord in the suburbs of London. And it was a contract of 10 years for which certain sums were paid. And the contract that was written down laid down all the conditions that the slave that had just been bought will go through. One amongst them, of course, is that he will never have any liaison in this 10 years with any woman. So such conditions not like it. I will think hard. I will say, I have it. Last time I saw it when we changed home, it is certainly there. I don't know where it is. And truth is, I don't care what it is. So that's the value of Chase. I'm glad it came right there. <laughs> but, but I mean, just on that point, let's go through an example, right, on how the Chase can get silly thanks to other events. And I, I think many of you may be aware of this, uh, these uh, Mahatma Gandhi's items that came up for auction about uh, a year and a half ago or something like that. And it came up in an auction house that I'm very familiar with, and they know that I have an interest in some of the stuff. So they called me, whatever, it's three, four weeks before this event. And if I remember, I have all the documentation at home. But um, I thought it started around uh, 30 to 40,000 in the estimate. And you know, I said, is it worth it? What's the condition? Blah, 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 the usual stuff. And somewhere along the way, the Indian media obviously got a hold of this. And you know, it started playing through. And, you know, the whole thing started getting whipped into a frenzy. And uh, if I had my computer, I could even show you some of those old emails. Their estimate was changing every half day. You know, and I remember two days before the auction, he says, I think this is going to be as high as half a million. I said, wow. And then, I think he eventually hammered at about 1.7 million or something. 30 to 40K, just because of this, you know, frenzy. That, that, and who paid for the Indian taxpayer? Ultimately, you know, because of all this nonsense. Um, so, you know, there's a chase that went completely haywire, right? Uh, completely out of control. And, of course, the winner was the guy who was selling it, this chap in LA. Uh, and the auction house, which takes, whatever, 20, 20, 25 percent, thanks to the Indian media going uh, crazy. So, that's, a, that's an interesting story, right? Um, and, and you have these happening every so often. And, and I think, I suspect, you know, talking about this, our heritage coming back, we're going to have more of these instances, uh, or even coming back to Nimalia's point, saying, you know, if I put all my the goals, you know, the politicians, the bureaucrats, somewhere along the way, we've got this proprietary feeling around. I mean, Tipu Sultan's sword, or Shivar is one of those swords. That's another example, right? So, 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 some of these artifacts are just being bid up to, to unreal prices, um, just thanks to, you know, this, the, the chase by the media. Now it's not even a buyer. Right? The media are going crazy and chasing these things. But I guess that's part of a culture in transition. Yeah, I think that's what it is, culture.
I would like to ask a question to the panel. I don't, I don't one common uh, thing which seems to be binding all of you is your deep love for art. Why your principles that you follow may be very different, very divergent. But the fact is you're all bound by your deep addiction to uh, art itself. Now, art in our country, unfortunately, still seems to be very, very exclusive. And we don't seem to be making any move in terms of breaking art or making it inclusive. Even in our own case, uh, you know, whenever we went around to cities and galleries, we've always, in our own hometown, hesitated quite a bit even to enter into a gallery. We found it very imposing till this lady walked into our life called Ashrafi Bhagat, who held our hands and introduced us to the world of art. And since then, it's been a dream journey. But the point is that, you know, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years down the line, we are going to be the youngest nation in the world with an average, possibly nearly 40% of the Indians below the age of 20, 25. Now, the panel was mentioning, you know, when we go abroad, uh, we visit museums. When we visit museums, okay, the discipline is one part of it. But you would find a whole lot of school children trooping in, getting themselves exposed. And it's a real pleasure and treat to listen to the teachers giving these kids an exposition in terms of what is happening there. We went to visit the Delhi Museum or? Uh, I don't know. I mean, there was absolutely nobody there and the place was as, as dead as ever. So what is it that we can do? People like you, giving the leadership, possibly ably supported by the rest of us, in terms of getting the government's attention and get them involved in making art and uh, our culture a lot more inclusive, making it more, uh, you talked about, uh, Ranbir talked about the uh, museum. Uh, the point is, I mean, he made an excellent point. People troop in there from Tirupati. But how much of what stuff they take back after visiting that place? So what is it that we can do? Do you have any ideas on this? At the risk of beating a dead horse, <laughs> it, is, it is intimidating to, to go into a museum and not understand what's around you, the context, the history, the relevance. And, you know, there aren't enough guides. Um, and, and, you know, museums outside India use technology quite advantageously. They, you know, you can listen as you walk around, you know, through a head, uh, you know, set of headphones, what's happening around you. Um, and I think the same needs to happen here. Um, we can use technology to remove the intimidation, which I believe is, 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 is quite a big factor. Um, and if people start exploring online, you know, in the privacy of their own closet, if you will, um, at some point they get something triggers in them. Um, and that's why I'm a believer in putting as many of these resources as possible online. Whether it's blogs, whether it's articles, whether it's, you know, artwork, whether it's audio about, you know, certain things. I'm a big believer. Actually, you know, my daughter is nine years old. She goes to school in Switzerland. And I know that one of her assignments this year was to pick any work of art and write about it, and then repaint it. So she had to do a painting, you know, reproduce it, and then write about it and talk about why she chose it or not. And I guess that's how you get people to infuse, get an appreciation for culture at an early age. So I think just to respond to, to the gentleman's question, uh, and I think picking up on, on both these themes, I mean, if I go back to when I went through school here in the drugs, we had a drawing class. <laughs> Right? I, yeah, I hated it. Um, so, you know, where you were taught to draw, and that was the end of the story, there was never anything beyond that in terms of how is, why is that relevant or, or how does that fit into um, a cultural paradigm or what have you. So perhaps, you know, to some extent that starts at home or, or, or in, the, in the school, the school's not doing it, you do it in the home. Maybe it's changed. No, okay. there are classes that are much more hands-on, okay. like similar projects what we do, and our kids have just been put tomorrow and Saturday going to all the 